coming up next on Another View, a look at race from a white male perspective. Michael Wenger is a Jewish man from New York who in the 1970s marries an African-American woman from the segregated South. He chronicles his experiences being in an interracial relationship and his work promoting racial justice during the turbulent 60s and 70s. His book is called My Black Family, My White Privilege, a white man's journey through the nation's racial minefield. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. We take another view on race in America with author Michael Wenger right after this news from NPR. Discussing the issues and celebrating the successes of the African-American community. This is Another View. I just love that studio audience. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Welcome to Another View. Welcome to February and welcome to Black History Month. And before we get into our discussion with Arthur Michael Wenger um, about his book, My Black Family, My White Privilege, I want to tell you about a um, series of 26 special programs that are going to air on WHRV and WHRO-FM. And they are celebrating the history of the city of Hampton. Let's let Lisa Godley tell us a bit more. Since 1619, Hampton has played a pivotal and crucial role in America's freedom story. It's the geographical location where the institution of slavery began, and 250 years later, where it begins to die. Introducing from Kickatan Village to national treasure, Hampton's Hidden History, a 26-segment series celebrating courageous acts little known in mainstream history, much of it around our enslaved population. Join us beginning next week for the first in the series of From Kikatan Village to National Treasure, Hampton's Hidden History. From Kikatan Village to National Treasure, Hampton's Hidden History. It starts Wednesday, February 6th. That's next Wednesday. And it will run through the month of March. On WHRV, you can hear it at 6.33 a.m. and on, on Wednesdays and Sundays at 8.34 a.m. And also on our sister station, WHRO-FM, you can hear the segments Wednesdays at 3 p.m. and Sundays at 9 a.m. So that's from Kikatan Village to National Treasure, Hampton's Hidden History. Should be some exciting programming. So I'm going to paraphrase something, um, but there is a saying that goes, you cannot understand the plight of another until you've walked in his or her shoes. And while Arthur Michael Wenger can never be African-American, he says he's walked closely enough to know what racism feels like, both personally and professionally. He's the author of My Black Family, My White Privilege, A White Man's Journey Through the Nation's Racial Minefield. Michael, welcome to Another View. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I want to start by reading something from your book. Um, and this is a discussion where you were talking about kind of how the whole idea of white privilege had come to you. And it's on page 14. I'm going to read a little excerpt from it, and then we can talk about it um, on the other side. But you, you're talking about the fact that President Lyndon Johnson def- um, defended affirmative action. Um, he makes references to the experiences of the Negro compared to experiences of the European immigrants who had been able to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Now, President Johnson said, quote, they did not have the heritage of centuries to overcome, and they did not have a cultural tradition which had been twisted and battered by endless years of hatred and hopelessness. Nor were they excluded, these others, because of race or color, a feeling whose dark intensity is matched by no other prejudice in our society. Then you go on to write, I didn't feel privileged when I was growing up. I doubt my parents did either. But we had bootstraps and no chains. As I have come to understand in my life journey, that has made all the difference. So bootstraps and no chains. Is that what defines privilege to you? Uh, To a great extent, it absolutely does. Um, My parents, uh, uh, my grandparents were uh, certainly not rich. They were working class. My mother's uh, father was a shoemaker. Uh, my father uh, was an embroiderer in the garment district and then 
owned a small hardware store that would uh, fit inside someone's small home. Um, um, but what they had was the ability uh, to rise in the society. They had bootstraps. They were able uh, to see their way clear um, uh, to rise in the society. A quick example. Uh, my grandfather was a shoemaker, and he worked in a shoe factory. He was part of a union. Uh, there were uh, black men who worked in that shoe factory. They were menial laborers. They were janitors, and they could not join a union. Mm -hmm. So my grandfather um, had the benefits of union membership and then retirement pension from the union, something that his African-American co-workers uh, simply didn't have. And that is the kind of thing uh, that I talk about in the book, um, and there are countless examples of that. And so it's, it's institutional as well as, as um, emotional in terms of, of the different examples that you give. Um, tell us how you became so involved in the civil rights movement. It started in college. Yeah, uh, actually, it, um, I grew up in a family, uh, a very progressive family. My uh, parents were always um, advocates for justice, advocates for peace, uh, that sort of thing. So I come by it uh, fairly naturally. But um, I was in college at Queens College in New York City and was not really involved in anything very much. And I was walking down the hall of one of the buildings uh, one uh, late afternoon, and uh, I saw a group gathered in a classroom, and there was a guy standing outside, and I asked him what was going on. Um, and he told me it was a meeting. This was 1961, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, he told me it was a meeting of uh, the Queens College chapter of CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. And he invited me to join them. And so I walked in just curious. Um, and as it turned out, I got very involved. This gentleman that I met in the hall became my closest friend, is still my closest friend today. Um, and that's how I got involved in Queens College. Uh, in the early 60s was really a hotbed of of activity. Uh, mm -hmm. We started a tutoring project uh, in one of the in South Jamaica um, for um, African American kids. We engaged in marches and fundraising and that sort of thing. And as you may be aware, Andy Goodman, who was one of the civil rights workers killed in 1964. Uh, was a Queens College student who mm -hmm. most of us knew. Mm -hmm. So, but prior to going to college and so forth, it, it, you didn't have any any necessarily dislike of African Americans, but you really just didn't interact. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting. I write in my book about my parents, who I said uh, uh, were very progressive. In fact, they mm -hmm. were uh, uh, the only white members of an NAACP chapter, uh, not very far from our house. But it's interesting because as progressive as they were, they were in many ways, um, uh, uh, how do I want to say this, but they didn't understand, and I didn't understand at the time, the differences uh, between the way white people were treated and the way black people were treated. One real mm -hmm. simple example is uh, my, on the street where my father's hardware store was, was a... Um, a drugstore next door with a soda fountain. And he used to send me, when I was a kid and hung out in the store, he'd send me next door to get him a, a cold drink on a hot day during the summer. And there were two black men who worked behind the soda fountain, and they were the only two employees on that entire street who I was allowed to call by their first name. Mm -hmm. um, and it it was something that did I wasn't conscious of at the time, and I'm sure my parents were not conscious of it, but it was an indication of how differently we viewed even liberal people, progressive people, how uh, even though they believed in equal rights and justice, how differently they viewed black people as opposed to white people mm -hmm. at that time. And, you know, it, it's it's hard because I've, I've read the book and there's so many nuances <laughs> in, in this that an hour just will not allow us to discuss. But you do have a connection to Virginia that is a very important connection in terms of your work um, during Massive Resistance. Can you tell us a little right. bit about that? Sure. Um, uh, 
as I said, we were uh, part of the Queens College chapter of uh, the Congress of Racial Equality, uh, James Farmer's organization at that time. And um, as I'm sure many of your listeners know, in Prince Edward County, Virginia, uh, due to massive resistance, um, the uh, uh, authorities actually closed the schools rather than desegregate them. And so from 1959 to 1964, the public schools in Prince Edward County were closed. White kids went to private academies. Black kids, about 1,700 of them, were shut out of school for uh, that period of time. In 1963, due to the efforts of Bobby Kennedy, who was then Attorney General, and Reverend L. Francis Griffin, who was the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Farmville, and then the president of the Virginia NAACP, uh, were able to secure a grant from the Ford Foundation to reopen the schools as uh, private free schools. Uh, and uh, Reverend Griffin uh, uh, contacted a uh, faculty member who was one of our faculty advisors at Queens College, one of the few uh, African-American faculty members at uh, Queens at the time, and asked her if there would be some student volunteers who could go to Farmville for the summer to work with uh, kids who'd been shut out of school for four years and then uh, and prepare them uh, to return to school in, in the fall. And 16 of us uh, spent the uh, summer uh, in Prince Edward County uh, setting up uh, schools in the basements of churches and that sort of thing uh, to try to prepare the kids uh, to go back to school. And frankly speaking, it was, I mean, it's a powerful experience for me uh, and for my fellow students. It's also heartbreaking uh, because we saw uh, kids who were six, seven, eight years old who'd never been to school, didn't even know how to hold a pencil. Um, we saw teenage kids who'd had their lives totally disrupted by four years uh, without school. And it was a pretty um, heart-rending experience, um, as well as a very educational experience for all of us. You all had to do some preparation also in terms of how you were going to behave in Farmville, <laughs> didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, we were young and uh, arrogant and thought uh, we were going to change the world. And um, Reverend Griffin and our faculty advisor, uh, Dr. Rachel Weddington, who passed away about a year or two ago at the age of 94, I think mm -hmm. it was, um, gathered us together and said, okay, uh, this, is, this is an experience uh, like none of, uh, this is going to be an experience like none other you've ever had, and here are the rules. And, you know, so we were not to attract attention as if 16, um, <laughs> uh, there were 15 white kids and one uh, black kid, as if... Uh, 15 white, uh, predominantly Jewish kids from New York City wouldn't attract attention in Prince Edward County, Virginia. But we were told we could not do anything to attract attention. We had to go out in groups. We could not go out at night, uh, various things like that. Mm -hmm. And, of course, after a few weeks and nothing happened, I mean, the reception of the white population in Prince Edward County was more of disdain than anything else. Mm -hmm. Um and so we're feeling pretty good. And one night, a group, an interracial group of us decided we'd go out to the Tasty Freeze for some ice cream. And it was one of the scariest um, and probably one of the d uh, dumbest things uh, we could have possibly done because there we were out in a fair, fairly rural area with uh, just a Tasty Freeze and a gas station around. And we were ordering our uh, Tasty Freeze, and suddenly we... Uh, two uh, car loads of white teenagers pulled up, and uh, uh, we were quickly surrounded. We quickly forgot about our tasty freeze <laughs> and wondered if we were going to survive uh, the next 10 minutes. And it, what happened was very interesting because white teenagers surrounded us. There were about six or seven of us, including um, uh, a couple of white girls and uh, Reverend uh, uh, Douglas, Goodwin Douglas, who was a young pastor of the AME Church in mm -hmm. Farmville. And uh, one of the white kids kicked Reverend Douglas, uh, which not unsurprising, you know, the idea of a black man uh, with white women. 
uh, and we were thinking we're in we're in deep serious trouble. And Dr. Weddington, who was one of the strongest uh, people I have ever known in my life, uh, simply uh, motioned to us to follow her, and she walked right through that circle of white teenagers to the car, and they. I don't know if they were intimidated by her or surprised by her uh, strength, um, but they sort of parted ways, parted um, the circle, and we got in our cars and went back to Reverend Douglas's parsonage. And um, the white kids buzzed the house in their cars for about an hour. Mm. We called the police. The uh, police station was about a half a block from the parsonage. It took them over an hour to get there. Um, mm. And then they, and they were and half they a block sta- away. Yeah, half a block away. Uh, and they stayed about five minutes, took our statements, and then told us uh, to stay out of trouble. And wow. And we never heard from them again. Dr. Weddington was African American? Yes, she yes, was. was. That, mm-hmm. That's what I thought. Um, yeah. So, so that was an experience that, that you had then. The black community, though, embraced you all, didn't it? Oh, they did. And it was one of the great learning experiences of our lives and one of the great examples of courage uh, on the part of those black families. They took us in and housed us for the summer. Uh, we lived with uh, with the Watkins family, myself and another uh, young man, uh, but we all lived with black families in the community, and that um, was a, an example of enormous courage on their part because um, uh, they, we were going to leave at the end of the summer, and they were there, uh, remaining there. Their lives were there. And there are all sorts of dangers that they could have encountered from the white population that was not happy that we were there. And yet they had the courage um, uh, to house us, um, and uh, despite the uh, potential dangers to themselves, both physical and economic, Mm-hmm. You know, and, through, and throughout the book, um, in various uh, uh, asked parts of your life where you have been surrounded by and embraced by the African-American community when the white community was not as accepting. Why do you think that is from your perspective? Well, uh, first of all, what you say is absolutely true, uh, whether it was um, the family of my wife mm-hmm. um, uh, whether it was uh, people with whom I worked, um, I was always always felt embraced and, in fact, safer um, in the black community than I did in the white community. Part of that had to do, actually, with my experience in Prince Edward County. We spent the entire summer being embraced by the black community of Prince Edward County and being disdained at best. Uh, mm-hmm. and intimidated at worst by the white community. And after a while, after you've been in that environment for a while, uh, it, it begins to be a bit subconscious. Um, and so when we went back to New York City at the end of the summer, um, we felt much more comfortable uh, with black people than we did with white people. And we looked at white people with a great deal of suspicion. Um <laughs> because of our experiences during the summer in Prince Edward County, and that carried over even later when I was in an interracial marriage and felt much safer and much more embraced in the black community than I did in the white community, Mm. which was suspicious of interracial marriages and And not happy with them. That's very interesting, because did you ever want to to say to to a white person when you found yourself in this situation, you know, look, you know, I'm a white guy, you're a white guy, what's the problem? I mean, did you ever get that kind of feeling that you wanted to engage with them in that type of conversation? Um, Well, at times I did. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, and sometimes it went well and sometimes it didn't go so well Um, but um, you know one of the things that um, I've come to feel uh, in my life is that um, I want to engage with people who I think um, I have an opportunity to uh, make more aware I don't want to say enlightened because that Mm. sounds sort of self-serving but I want to engage with people who I think may be unaware of certain realities, but 
who hopefully by sharing some of my story, I can make them more aware and more uh, uh, more aware of persistent racism in the society that they may not be aware of. But it feels to me like people who are blatantly racist are not people who I want to spend my time with, nor people who I really want to engage with. Mm -hmm. um, um, it it uh, feels like, a, frankly, a waste of time. There are plenty of people who's, uh, who may act in racist ways but are not blatantly racist, and those are the kind of people who I think can be changed if their awareness of persistent racism in the society uh, is raised. And those mm -hmm. are the kind of people I want to deal with. I'm going to fast forward us to your um, when you moved to West Virginia to work yeah. with um, a rural um, um, Appalachian people in West Virginia and so forth. And there's a part that you wrote that I want to read you to to take us through this part of the conversation. You said, mm -hmm. um, f quote, for the first week or two, I was convinced I'd made a serious mistake. I could never fit in here. I was ill prepared for the job and people would never accept me. And I struggled with the concept of poor white people who were as oppressed and powerless as poor black people. That line just jumped out at me when you said that, because mm -hmm. I'm curious as to why that was such a struggle for you. Well, um, I had come to, uh, in part because of my experience in Prince Edward County, in part because of the power of the civil rights movement, the influence of the civil rights movement on my life, mm -hmm. um, I had come to have a stereotype about white people um, that was not very positive, and it, it never occurred to me that there were so many poor, powerless white people. And then I wind up in West Virginia almost by accident um, as part of the anti-poverty program. And I encounter people, uh, white people, who are just as poor and as powerless, if not more so, uh, than uh, people I had encountered uh, during uh, um, my civil rights activities. And that was just stunning to me. Um, and that was complicated by the fact uh, that I was in a bit of culture shock here. Um, New York I, uh, to West Virginia, I would say that yeah, was culture shock. <laughs> yeah, you know, New yeah. York City, uh, I hadn't ever lived outside of New York City except for a couple of fairly unsuccessful years I spent at Cornell University, and then I was surrounded by New York City residents anyway uh, mm -hmm. who were at Cornell. And now here I am, and... Oh, almost purely by accident, in rural southern West Virginia, coal mining country. And I didn't have a clue, um, to tell you the truth. I had no idea what slag heaps were, burning uh, coal residue. I had no idea, um, you know, I, a s simple thing. Mm -hmm. uh, in New York City, when I ate a hot dog, um, I don't care much for mustard, but when I ate a hot dog, I ate a hot dog, plain. Uh, mm -hmm. In West Virginia, you don't eat hot dogs without chili and slaw and all sorts of other fixings on it. It was just bizarre to me, you know, it, which tells you a little bit about how sheltered my life had been um, up until that point. Mm -hmm. uh, that, but uh, no, go ahead. But I, I was ju well, I was just stunned by the fact that um, poverty uh, actually knows no no skin color, and mm -hmm. powerlessness actually knows no skin color. Um, it, it is true that. Um, African Americans, because of the legacy of our history, are disproportionately uh, poor. But uh, but uh, poverty actually knows no skin color. If you're just joining us, we're talking with author Michael Wenger, the author of My Black Family, My White Privilege, A White Man's Journey Through the Nation's Racial Minefield. Join our conversation at 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. I'd especially love to hear from those of you who are involved in interracial relationships and whether or not that has changed your perspective on race in this country. 440-2665 or one 800-940-2240. Michael, I'm, I know I'm like pushing you through history really quickly here, but let's talk, <laughs> let's talk about how you met Tempe and how you came to marry a black woman from Clinton, North Carolina. Uh, well, I was working in the anti-poverty program uh, in uh, Beckley, West Virginia, and uh, the uh, organization 
organization I was working with, the Raleigh County Community Action Association, was undergoing some changes. And so the Office of Economic Opportunity in Washington, D.C., decided to send a consultant uh, uh, to Beckley uh, to look at what we were doing and to help us uh, with some of the things we were doing. And that person happened to be Tempe. Um, and uh, I was the person who was charged with uh, chauffeuring her around the county and explaining to her what we were doing and all of that sort of thing. And so over a period of time, a good part of the summer of uh, 1968, um, I believe it was, mm-hmm. um, we got to know each other uh, pretty well. And she began to talk about uh, some aspects of her life, and I talked about some aspects of my life. And we became uh, fairly close. And as I write in the book, it was the first time I had ever really uh, been involved in a close relationship with an African-American person, despite the progressive environment in which I grew up, despite my civil rights activities, all of that. Um, this was the first time I was ever having a real personal, intimate relationship um, with an African-American woman, and we just uh, hit it off over time. Um, I was fairly naive about the problems we'd face, and, um, uh, Tempe was not at all naive about those problems, and I tell a couple of stories uh, in the book about um, uh, before we were married, uh, there was one evening when we were sitting in my apartment in Beckley just talking, and I had a garage apartment, an apartment over a garage, and um, suddenly we hear heavy footsteps uh, uh, outside and a heavy knock on the door, and four of Beckley's uh, uh, finest, so to speak, uh, walk in, uh, all of them uh, big men um, with their um, uh, guns and all, and telling, and the uh, first one says to me, what's she doing here? And I said, she's a friend, we're talking. Uh, he said, get her out of here, take her back where she belongs. Um, mm. And I, I didn't know what to say. I was pretty intimidated, to tell you the truth. Um and um, I said, but we're just talking, we're friends. And he looked at me and he said, get her out of here in five minutes or I'll arrest you both for cohabitation. Wow. Um, so uh, needless to say, I did what they said and Tempe never came back to my apartment that summer. Um, but we grew close. Um, she moved to Washington, D.C. after the summer. She was in a marriage uh, that wasn't working. Um and she was separated from her then husband, and she had two adorable children uh, who were then ages six and four. And I'd come up to D.C. Uh, uh, on weekends, um, and we'd spend time together, and eventually, uh, against her better judgment, I persuaded her to move to West Virginia, um, and we got married and actually spent uh, another um, uh, 12 or 13 years uh, well, actually, about 10 more years uh, in West Virginia um, in an interracial marriage. Uh, we had a son, um, and uh, so um, that's that's the story of that. But there were, there were a number of incidents along the way that I write about in the book, the Beckley police incident being mm-hmm. one. Um, <laughs> we, uh, I chuckle now. Uh, it wasn't so uh, funny at the time, but... Uh, one night, and this shows my naivete as opposed to Tempe's realism. Mm-hmm. Um, one night, we decided late at night that we were hungry and we wanted to go out for something to eat. And there's uh, no restaurant in Beckley open at 10 o'clock at night, uh, at least <laughs> not back then. Uh, but on the West Virginia Turnpike, which uh, went uh, through Beckley, there was a rest stop that stayed open later. So we went out there. Uh, and Tempe said, are you sure we ought to do this? Uh, white man and black woman late at night out on a rest stop. Especially on the since you had bike. already experienced the police coming to your home. So you yeah, knew well, that that just, was going to be an issue. Yeah, it just tells you how naive I really was. <laughs> um, so I said, oh, no, no problem. We'll, you know, we'll be fine. Well, we go out there and we sit at the counter at the rest stop. Um, and uh, I won't go through the whole story, but the bottom line is there was one young white uh, woman, wait, young white waitress there, 
and she didn't serve us. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, several times I spoke up and said, um, we're waiting to be served. You know, I was trying to be nice. Um, And it was clear she wasn't going to serve us. And I got angrier and angrier and angrier. And Tempe said several times, let's go. And I said, no, I'm not going to let her intimidate us or uh, not serve us. And finally, it was clear she wasn't going to serve us. And Tempe finally jerked me from the counter. Um, (laughs) And as we were leaving... There was a an empty glass uh, uh, on the counter, and I pushed the glass off, um, and it hit at the waitress's feet and cut her ankle. Mm. And, and uh, Tempe had some choice words for me as she pulled me out of the place. Um, but uh, I, I shared that incident because it indicated, A, how naive I was, and how difficult it is to endure that kind of uh, discrimination, and how strong uh, African Americans had to be at that time, as well as now, uh, to uh, rise above that sort of thing Mm -hmm. and maintain a level of dignity despite uh, the uh, outrageous behavior of of racist people. Did, and Tempe also faced a lot of um, issues in terms of, you talk about in the book, in terms of particularly black men, I believe, um, who had issues with the fact that she was dating you or married yeah. to you. Yeah. Um, actually, it's interesting. That happened more uh, when I was visiting in Washington, before we were married, actually. Uh-huh. When I was visiting in Washington, D.C., when I'd come up on weekends and we'd go downtown in Washington, D.C., um, and um, black men would, in some cases, um, say things to her um, about, you know, she's uh, being disloyal uh, to African-American men. And she actually had some uh, African-American male friends who um, uh, did not look kindly uh, on our relationship. Interestingly, we had less of a problem. We lived in Charleston, West Virginia. Uh, we obviously were not going to live in Beckley. Um, but uh, we lived in Charleston uh, when uh, uh, Tempe moved there and we got married. Uh, and we didn't have too much. Uh, we had a few incidents where young uh, white teenagers would yell the N word. Uh, Mm-hmm. Uh, out of a car as they were passing and that sort of thing. But we actually found an interesting uh, interracial community in Charleston, which I never would have expected. And we had less trouble in Charleston than we did when we were in mm-hmm. D.C. Well, when incidents like that would happen, though, would you and Tempe talk about it? I mean, would she? Would you be able to understand her perspective on how that made her feel and how did it make her feel? What would oh, she say well, about it? Well, it's interesting. At one one evening, we were talking about it, and she looked at me and she said, uh, "Michael, I wish you were black." Um, and I, mm-hmm. at the time, I didn't know what to say and didn't know how to follow up, so I just sort of moved on from that. But I don't think I really came to understand that um, till long after we were divorced um, and mm-hmm. not married any longer. Part of the uh, for me, uh, part of the benefit of writing the book was as I was writing, I was understanding more. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and part of the essence of white privilege, as I write in the book, is that, you know, I could go through all of these incidents uh, in my life and they would hurt for a minute and then I'd put them out of my mind because I'm living in a white dominated society. Um, and it wasn't until I began to write the book that I began to understand um, uh, these incidents more deeply and began to understand how deeply they affected Tempe, how deeply they have, some of these incidents have affected my children. Um, and part of the white privilege was I was able to compartmentalize them and not think about them uh, except in the moment because... Mm-hmm. I live in a society where people are not discriminating against me. Mm-hmm. Um, 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Khalil joins us from Norfolk. Hi, Khalil. You're on the air. Oh, hello. Um, 
Yeah, I just wanted to uh, share my experience. Um, I'm in an interracial relationship right now, and uh, me and this girl are extremely connected. We've known each other for a really long time, but her father is extremely racist, um, and her mom is kind of like not so much, but sort of just goes along with whatever her husband says, and so... We're in a situation now where we are still together. We plan on staying together, but we don't know if it's really if we're if we're fighting against the grain too much. Like mm -hmm. she's afraid that we're never going to be able to get married, and like we're not going to be able to have those uh, epic family sort of dynamics that normal couple couples get to uh engage in because uh, you know she doesn't she thinks that her father will basically keel over and have a heart attack and die as soon as he finds out so Khalil, he still doesn't even know Khalil what's what is the relationship who's african american and who's white I'm african american okay. she's white okay Okay. Well, I'm gonna we, let also, we also mm -hmm. actually get a lot of problems. Uh, I get a lot of uh, comments from African-American females, going back to what your guest was saying about, you know, how African-American males would harass, you know, his lady with that whole thing. Mm -hmm. So that, that actually still happens in 2013. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, let's let uh, Michael uh, respond. Michael, talk a little bit about your relationship with Tempe's family, because they were more accepting, if I'm not mistaken, than perhaps some of the members of your family. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, actually, uh, yeah, to a degree. Actually, as I said, I've been fairly blessed in my life. My parents uh, accepted my relationship with Tempe, although some of my uh, other relatives, aunts and uncles, did not. Um, but my parents did, and um, my father's only concern uh, uh, at least expressed concern at the time was whether or not I knew what I was doing marrying a woman who had two young children. Um, but there was never any issue with my parents um, about uh, Tempe being African-American. Um, and my father was actually perfectly willing uh, to um, uh, uh, ignore his family's, his siblings' reactions um, mm -hmm. to the marriage. Uh, Tempe's mother, when she first met me, um, told uh, Tempe told me this afterwards, uh, called me a white devil, and and actually, given her upbringing and her life in the Jim Crow South, that's not surprising. Uh, but once we were there, once we visited Clinton, and I got to know her and got to know. Um, all of Tempe's family, they were very accepting of me, and I never had uh, any sort of problem like that um, at all. Uh, I guess what I'd say to Khalil uh, is that if the love is strong enough, and there are plenty of successful interracial uh, couples, um, if the love is strong enough, and um, if uh, the woman that you're who you're with um, uh, feels strongly enough, um, you know, the reaction of parents, while difficult to endure, um, has to take a back seat. I, mm -hmm. I say that, you know, it's easy for me to say that, um, and I know it's very difficult uh, when you're in that situation. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, the society is much more accepting today of interracial couples than it was uh, 40 some years ago when Tempe and I got married. Um, now you and Tempe, you, you were married for 11 years. You got divorced. And I am very curious because you don't say in the book, you, you mentioned that she remarries, but you don't say whether she remarried an African American or a white person. Uh, she remarried an African American man, mm -hmm. um, who has since passed away. Mm -hmm, okay. Um, uh, but, uh, she got remarried. We got divorced in 1980, the latter part of, um, mm -hmm. I think it was 81, actually. But the uh, divorce was not necessarily because of racial tension. No, I write in the book that the divorce was more a matter of, I, I think, class issues. And I think Tempe agrees with that. She and I recently had a conversation about that. As a matter of fact, we remain uh, friends. Um, 
but it was more about class. I was raised in a working slash middle class uh, home where we wanted for nothing. We had mm -hmm. plenty of food on the table. Uh, we may have worn hand-me-down clothes, but we always had plenty of clothes, that sort of thing. Uh, Tempe was raised in a very different environment, and so our values around money and how to use money were different, and that was a significant uh, area of disagreement um, uh, among us. Another area of disagreement, and this has something to do with race uh, tangentially, and that is the way we discipline uh, children. Uh, mm -hmm. I grew up in a home where democratic decision-making was a value. Tempe grew up in a home where her mother ruled with an iron hand. Um, and part of that has to do with the fact Tempe has, has a brother, uh, and part of that has to do with the way um, uh, black parents had to teach their children uh, in, Jim, in the Jim Crow South how to behave so as not to get themselves killed. Mm -hmm. uh, and... You know, that was never an issue uh, in my family. And so uh, in Tempe's family, discipline was much more strict, um, sometimes involved uh, uh, hitting, mm -hmm. um, spanking. spanking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and in my family, that, you know, spanking, uh, I don't think I, I can't ever remember being spanked. And um, I was, you know, when there were decisions to be made, uh, our home was sort of a bastion of democratic decision-making. And I write in the opening of the book how stunned I was uh, on one of my early visits to Clinton when Tempe's mother said it was on an Easter weekend, and Tempe's mother said, you're going to church on Sunday morning. And um, and you got and up and I went said, to church on Sunday morning. <laughs> yeah, after, after spending the night out, I write at the beginning of the book, you know, we thought, okay, fine, and I didn't think twice about it. Um, and we went out um, clubbing that night. We left the kids uh, with uh, Tempe's parents, and we went out clubbing, and we came back about 3 or 4 in the morning after what I call a modest overindulgence of alcohol <laughs> and had no plans to go to church on Sunday morning. And at that time, uh, the home that Tempe's parents lived in was heated by wood-burning stoves, and we're sleeping uh, on a North Carolina morning where it's 80 degrees outside. We're sleeping next to a wood-burning stove that Tempe's mother began stoking at 7 in the morning, and she literally roasted us out of bed, and we went to church that morning and every Sunday morning that we were in Clinton. <laughs> I really want to talk to you really quickly. We've only got about three minutes left about Ian, about your son, because I sure. noticed in all of your descriptions um, that you did not necessarily take him into the black community um, in terms of learning to grow up like a black man. And what I mean by that, as, as you were talking about with Tempe's family, how discipline was meant so that you could learn survival skills. Mm -hmm. Ian's raising was was pretty much um, in in more of a white middle class environment. Would yeah, you agree it with was, that? Okay, it was. Except that what I would note is we raised him to think of himself as African American, okay. even though he was, uh, pre even though we lived predominantly in white middle class communities, and he went to uh, at least except for the last two years of high school, went to private schools in predominantly white environments. But we raised him uh, to see himself as African-American because we knew that that's the way the society would view him, and if he was going to survive, he had to know who he was. Um, and what's interesting about that is when he went to college, he chose to go to Morehouse. Mm -hmm. um, because he wanted to be in a, uh, an environment that was predominantly African-American. But one of the things he learned at Morehouse was a sense of self-worth and a sense of identity, um, which has enabled him uh, to move extremely easily uh, among people from all types of racial backgrounds and racial groups because of the sense of uh, the strong sense he has of who he is. Mm -hmm. um, and. 
so the combination, uh, I think, has been uh, uh, pretty powerful for him. Boy, Michael, there is so much more I want to talk to you about. I wanted to ask you about whether you think we're in a post-racial society um, with the no. election of President <laughs> Obama, and you say no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we've only... We've, we've found- We've come a long way in 50 years, but we've got a heck a of a long way, to way still, still to go. The name of the book is My Black Family, My White Privilege, A White Man's Journey Through the Nation's Racial Minefield. It's by Michael Wenger. We really appreciate you joining us on Another View today. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Take care, and we'll be right back. It don't matter if you're black or white. And welcome back. They've been honored with just about every music award available and have even been credited with gospel great Kirk Franklin for expanding the fan base of urban contemporary gospel music. I'm talking about the dynamic singing duo Mary Mary. In addition to their new reality show, the sisters are about to resume their road tour. All this um, as rumors swirl that Mary Mary is calling it quits. The sisters recently sat with our Lisa Godley and talked about their reasons for doing a reality show, their thoughts on being role models and the breakup rumors. For Mary Mary, life is good. Since the group was formed in the late 90s, they brought home three Grammys, five Dove Awards, and two American Music Awards, to name a few of their many accolades. And did I mention they're up for two more Grammys next Sunday night? But these singer-songwriters from Inglewood, California, remain ever humble. We are ecstatic, overjoyed, excited. Um, Every single time you do an album, you you know you want people to enjoy it, so you kind of don't rest on the nomination of the last album. So it's new every single time, and, and we're always very very grateful. So excited and can't wait to see if we win. It's their hit, Go Get It, that debuted at number one on Billboard's Gospel Chart that helped them capture the nomination for Best Gospel Contemporary Christian Music Performance and Best Gospel Song. They grew up Erica and Tina Atkins in a family of nine children, but because of the proximity of their ages, they were very close. Both began their careers as backup singers, but eventually pooled their experience to form Mary Mary. The group's name is taken from two women in the Bible, Mary Magdalene and the Virgin Mary. Ironically, when the sisters married, they both married men whose last names were Campbell. Erica married music producer Warren Campbell and Tina married musician Teddy Campbell. They recently decided to share their lives with the world through a reality show on We. Well, at first, you're a little bit overwhelmed and you're, you know, a little bit reserved, but we were committed to being honest and telling our truth. So, you know, a lot of what the cameras catch is it's, it's a lot, but um, we're also a loving family and committed to our music ministry and trying to be um, the best professionals that we could possibly be. And the challenges that go along with that, we make sure that our reality show is real. It's not a bunch of trumped up, created um you know, stuff that we just we just want to create for the cameras or whatever. So that was kind of the only requirement. And as Erica said, sometimes it's a great experience. And sometimes it is overwhelming. Like, I don't want them here. I'm having a real argument. And I don't really want everybody in America to have to weigh in on what their opinions are because I don't care. You know what I mean? This is a short clip from their most recent episode titled Fight of a Lifetime. Right. The opportunity has um, come up. If you want to go pursue a solo career and do your own thing, Mary, we had a great run. Goodbye. It was probably this episode that sparked the rumors of the breakup, and the sisters were quick to address it. Erica is going to be pursuing some solo efforts in 2013. Everybody's wondering, is Mary Mary breaking up? Um, And I don't know if taking a break is necessarily breaking up. Taking a break is not breaking up, not a breakup, it's a break, and a very necessary one at this 
That said, their Go Get It tour continues this spring. There is no question that performing is in their blood, and being in the spotlight is something both Erica and Tina take very seriously. One thing that we uh, we realize is that when you have a, a platform like this, you have automatically become a role model. It doesn't matter if that's what you intended to do. Um, you just once you have a platform and everybody is watching, all eyes are on you. You all of a sudden inherit influence. So it's definitely important to us to use that. Well, not only do we want to make ourselves proud, we want to make our families proud. We want to make everybody that's African-American proud. We want to make women proud. We definitely do not profess perfection because um, I don't think we're ever going to get there. But we definitely try to do the best we can and be the best of ourselves so we can sleep well at night and be happy with who we are, whether we ever win an award or not. And they offer this advice to anyone interested in following in their footsteps. You have to be prepared. You have to be willing to work harder than anybody on your team if you want to win. Because success doesn't come and stay if you don't work hard. For another view, I'm Lisa Godley. And Mary Mary is up for an NAACP Image Award tonight, and we wish them the very best. Time now for things to view and do in Hampton Roads. You will be my Saturday love. The Newsom House Museum and Cultural Center presents Expressions 2, featuring eclectic works of Hampton Roads artist Tony Thorne. The opening reception is Saturday, February 2nd, from 2 until 4, and is free and open to the public. The exhibit is on display until March 30th. Call 247-2360 to find out more. The second annual Save Our Men Prostate Cancer Workshop and Screening is Saturday, February 2nd, from 9 until 11.30 a.m. at the Queen Street North Worship Center, North Armistead Avenue in Hampton. There will be free PSA tests, digital rectal exams, and educational workshops. To register, call 827-0488. Arthur Mai Haley presents a reading, Q&A, and signing of her book, The Treason of Mary Lustra, on Thursday, February 7th at 6.30 at the Norfolk State University Student Center. It's free and open to the public. Looking for ways to pay for college? It starts with the free application for federal student aid, or FAFSA form. The Virginia Tidewater Consortium for Higher Education holds its Super Saturday event, offering free professional one-on-one -on -one help completing the form. It's Saturday, February 9th from 9 until 2 at VTC's Educational Opportunity Center on Granby Street in Norfolk. Call 683-2312 with questions. These and other events are on our website, anotherviewradio.org. And while you're there, you can sign up for our eView newsletter. It's a once a week reminder of upcoming shows. And you can also find the podcast of all of our shows on Another View. And I'll tell you how to find the podcast on our website. Just go to another uh, whrv.org, click on listen, and then click on podcasts. And every show is there for your enjoyment. Uh, you can also find our shows on our website, anotherviewradio.org. Next week, it's the February edition of the Another View Roundtable. For producer Lisa Godley, audio engineer Perry Smith, Kendall Harrison, who answered the phones, I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Have a great weekend, and let's get together again next Friday at noon for Another View. And oh yeah, go Ravens! Caw! Ha, 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 ha.